Jesus, and it's number 624. Jesus, to 
and that is up there. So. Sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus, what a wonder you are. You are brighter than the morning star. You are fairer, much fairer than the lilies that grow by Precious, more precious than gold. I live for Jesus day after day. I live for Jesus. Let come what may. The Holy Spirit, I will obey. I live for Jesus day after Sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus, what a wonder you are. You are brighter than the morning star. You are fairer, much fairer than the lilies that go by the wayside. Precious, more precious than gold. Jesus, day after day, I live for Jesus, let come what way, the Holy Spirit, I will obey, I live for Jesus, day after day. song today 108 amazing grace and again first verse second verse fifth verse amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me for all the young people out there. Are you listening? Okay, young people, how many of you are back in school? All right. How many of you are glad to be back in school? Oh, good, there's still some hands. And parents, how many of you are glad your kids are back in school? Very nice. Welcome to the first Sabbath of the school year. We are glad you're here, and we're looking forward to praising God and um, worshiping and learning more about God today. Thank you for coming. 
before we invite Emily Wood up for the ministry moment, we have some church business. Um, we have a, an amazing person who has decided to be our new adventure leader. Her name is Melissa Armour. So um, can I get a motion to accept Melissa? Is there a second? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Amen. Welcome, Melissa. Happy Sabbath, church family. Oh, you guys are all awake. Yay. Okay, well, first, before I begin my ministry moment, I just want to highlight something in your church bulletins. The first item talks about the Health and Garden Cub potluck and the presentation today. And my mom and I... Uh, we're supposed to originally do it together, but on Wednesday, she tore her hamstring. So she is at home in bed with a brace and pain meds. But good news is I'm here, so I get to give it today. So if you guys are interested, go on and come and stop by right after church for the potluck, and then you're more than welcome to stay for the presentation. We're talking about how we changed our family's life to plant-based, um, more gluten-free because of chronic sickness, incorporating herbs, and trying to clean and simplify our home. So if you're interested, you can stop by for that. Now, for the ministry moment, I wanted to talk about what I did this summer. And past two summers, I worked at Camp Heritage in Missouri as a camp counselor and the, gr and the canoeing director. But this summer, I decided to do a little something different for ministry. And that something is called literature evangelism. And before I went to college, I had never heard what literature evangelism was. I knew that there were Jehovah Witnesses that went door to door and they handed out literature, but I didn't know that Christians could do it too. So I got super excited when I heard that we are able to do that as well. And a man named Joe Martin came to my school and he's from the Rocky Mountain Conference. He leads the student program out there. And he came to my school and I'd heard from a couple of my friends who had done literature evangelism about how an amazing program it is. So he came and talked to me about it. And what literature evangelism is, is they take different students from around the, around the country, and usually a lot of the different conferences have their own programs. But for the Rocky Mountain Conference, they focus mainly on Campion Academy students and Union College students. And so this year, there were a team of 17 of us. Most of us were under the age of 18, but there were a few that were in college. And we collected together. And this year, we worked in the Denver area. And so for eight weeks in the Denver area, we got as a team, and every day we went out, in groups of five, and we went and we knocked door to door, canvassing different books. And I meant to bring the books with me, but I forgot them at home, so I'm sorry. But we have different books, like a cookbook, a kid's cookbook, some kid's books, like A Prince of Peace, which talks about the life of Jesus. And then my three personal favorites, The Great Controversy, Desire of Ages, and then A Large Print, Steps to Christ. And we also, at every door, no matter what, we always try to leave them with a happiness for life, which is a steps to Christ, and it's a little small book. It has a hummingbird on it. And that's my favorite part, because I know that no matter if I make a sale at a house or if they try to slam the door in my face, I'm trying to give them a book that can lead them to Jesus Christ. And so I wanted to share a few of my testimonies and how it has had a profound impact, not only on the way I view ministry, the way I view the literature that our church puts out, and also the role that young people can play in being able to help lead people closer to Jesus and closer to God. And so the first one that I want to talk about comes from my first day working by myself. And I had learned the canvas in Spanish, and I was so excited because I'm trying to learn Spanish. And I figured, okay, if I can at least just tell them what I'm doing, I can maybe try to get them to get a book. Because my whole thing was I just wanted them to be able to have books about God. And so I walk up to a couple doors, and I'm with my leader, Brianna, because sometimes the leaders will help us, and they'll canvas for us, and they'll give us tips and just give us a break. And we had gone to the van to get more books. And normally I carry around um, one Spanish book, and that was The Great Controversy. But this, when I walked up to the van, I felt really, really impressed to grab another Spanish book. I was like, maybe today I'll sell a Spanish book. And I was like, oh, I don't want to carry that extra weight because we have to carry a bag that has all of our books in it, and then we have to carry books in our hand as well. 
and it's like 80 degrees out, and you're in jeans, so you're hot and tired. So I didn't want to carry another book. But I was like, okay, I'll just carry another one, and if nobody gets the book, I can just put it back later. And two, not two doors later, I came into my first Spanish home. And I knocked on the door, and my leader doesn't speak Spanish, and so I had to talk to them. And I talked to her in Spanish, and I showed her the two Spanish books that I had. And she was so excited. And I was blown away. I was just like, oh my goodness. Because if I had not had the other one, she really wanted the other book that I had grabbed. I had grabbed a piece of the storm in Spanish to carry too. And I found out that she, um, that she goes to church, but she'd really been looking for something to kind of reconnect her relationship with God. And she loves, loves to read. And so being able to bring her these books to her door really made a profound impact. And if I hadn't stepped out and listened to the Holy Spirit's guidance, because I pray every day that the Holy Spirit would lead me in ministry for literature evangelism, that I may be able to hear his voice and listen. And then the other one that I, um, the other testimony that I have is one where sometimes whenever you're walking along the street, somebody will see you and they'll ask you what you're doing. And so, of course, we walk up and we tell them, we're like, oh, I'm working on a scholarship project for school because with literature evangelism, you get a scholarship match. So you get part of your sales, and then the Union College matches it in a scholarship for me. They match, um, they match my earnings in a scholarship form. So I'm like, oh, I'm working on a scholarship program. Um, here, here's a free book that we're handing out. And it was an older woman, and so I gave her the happiness for life, and she started to talk to me and just kind of like open up because she saw that I was a Christian woman and that I was very kind and young. And so I was talking with her, and I noticed that my team was starting to move the other direction, and I was like, oh, no, I need to go catch up with them. So I was like, okay, I'll just talk to her for a little bit longer. And so I was talking with her and really just sharing with her, and she really appreciated that. And at this point, it had probably been like 20 minutes. I was like, oh, my goodness, where am I supposed to find my team? And so um, she finished talking with me, and right as I was walking down the street, this car pulls into a driveway. And it's one thing among the LEs that we always, we just really don't like it when people pull up into the driveways because they're getting home from work, they're tired, they're busy, they don't want to talk to you. But I felt impressed to walk up to the man who was getting out of his truck and go talk to him. And my team had already gone down the street but nobody had spoken to this man because he had just come home. And I didn't see, we leave these little Bible study cards in the doors, and I didn't see a card, so I didn't know if somebody else was home that had rejected someone or bought a book, but I was like, I'll just go talk to him, you know, maybe, maybe he'll be interested. If not, it's fine. So I went and I spoke to him, and I showed him my books, and he immediately fell in love with the cookbook and the great controversy. And so he was able to get both of those, and he made a very generous donation because um, we call it donations. We don't actually sell them. We leave them on donations, and there's like a price range for them. And then when I was walking to my teammates, I told them about what had happened, and they told me, no, none of us sold to that house. Um, we don't know how you were able to sell to that. The woman that answered the door was very rude to us. And so the fact that I was able to speak to the man and not the woman of the home really spoke volumes about now that they have books that can help them either through health or through their Christian walk and through their Christian experience. And these are just a couple of the testimonies that I have. I have literally a Word document just full of them because I was writing them down all summer. Um, But if there is a young person that is interested or even an older person that is interested in being able to help out, even if you just take a Steps to Christ and you carry a few in your bag and you see a homeless man or someone at the grocery store and you hand them a book, you're getting out of your comfort zone, but you're also reaching into theirs and showing them Christ. And so, if anything, what I would encourage you to do is maybe this week, take an extra moment to try to talk to someone about Jesus. Get a happiness for life or one of the books that are sitting out there in those little box things and give one to someone. It could be someone just walking down the street. You might never see that person again, but you might just see them in heaven because of the book that you left them. Thank you guys so much.
Today's call to worship is from Psalms 146, 1 through 6. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to God as long as I live. Don't put your trust in human leaders. Don't trust in people. They can't save you. When they die, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans are bound to fail. Blessed are those who depend on the God of Jacob for help. Blessed are those who put their hope in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth and the ocean. He made everything in them. The Lord remains faithful forever. Amen. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day and thank you for the Sabbath. Please help us to um, rest and be with you. And thank you for this day that we get to come to church. Amen. Amen. And now it is time for the children's story. So if the children would like to come down, please come on down. boys and girls. How many of you have a Bible in your house? Oh, that's great. This is the best book of all. Uh, and it tells us all kinds of things about God. I want to read a, word, uh, a verse to you from my Bible. It's found in the middle of the Bible in the book of Psalms, chapter 150 and verse 6. And this is what it says. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise you, the Lord. Can you think of anything that has breath? A cow has breath, okay. A cat has breath. A human has breath. A horse has breath. A dog has breath. Lost it, okay. A platypus, okay. A caterpillar has breath. Yell at me. A mantis has breath. Yes, that's right. Everything, every single thing that is alive breathes. Whether it's a huge animal as big as an elephant, or a tiny little animal, a tiny little bug, or an even tinier creature that you can't even see unless you have a, a magnifying glass. Do I look bigger? A magnifying glass or a microscope. Everything that is alive breathes. Did you know that eggs breathe? Did you? Yes. I want to show you some eggs this morning. 
egg three. Um, I'm going to see if you can show me. It's okay, Julia. Uh, show me if, if you think, if you know what this egg is. I'm going to find it. It's hiding here. Here it is. Anybody know what bird laid this egg? Think a blackbird like that? A who? A cuckoo? No. An ostrich? Not an ostrich. What do you think? You think so? Well, I'm going to find the right picture here. Now they got all mixed up. Guess what? It goes gobble, 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 gobble. A turkey laid this egg. That's right. Did you know that? That's what they look like. Okay. Let's see if you can tell me what, who laid this egg. I'll get put this over here. I'll get it mixed up too. Um, and maybe you've seen an egg like this. I don't know. Looks like this. Let everybody see it before you guess. Okay. A robin? Do you think a robin like this egg? How do you know? It's blue. Did you know there are a lot of other birds that lay blue eggs? But you're right. This is a robin egg. It is a robin egg. It's a bluebird. It's not a bluebird egg. And if you thought it was a hummingbird egg, those things are much smaller. Oh, they're really tiny little white eggs about the size of my fingernail, aren't they? They're really tiny hummingbird eggs are. Okay, let's let's look at this one. I have to be really careful. This one's already hatched, so I only have half an egg of this one. And it's white. What do you think? It's a How could you guess? <laughs> because what? Right, he saw my label. <laughs> it says morning dove in there. Sure enough, it is a morning dove egg. Do you want to know what a morning dove looks like? That's what a morning dove looks like. <laughs> and they go, Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Oh, let me show you another egg. It looks like a huge avocado, doesn't it? You think it's an ostrich egg? Yeah. Wrong, wrong, wrong. It's not an ostrich egg. What? It's an right, it's an emu. It's this, nope, wrong guy. <laughs> this one. As an emu. And it just looks like a great big it avocado. It looks like a solid avocado. It sure does. It's very ripe. Now, I want to show you this one. Ostrich. You think so? Yeah. Do you know what an ostrich looks like? That's an ostrich. Can I hold it? No. <laughs> um, if you look really close at this, you see little specks on it? Do you see those? Those are pores. Do you know what a pore is? It's little holes, isn't it? All eggs have pores, little tiny little holes that you can't even hardly see unless you look through a magnifying glass. Whoa. And, and you see, you look there, you see, see those little pits in there? Those are holes in the ostrich egg. Every shell, every shell has pores so that the baby chick 
growing inside can get enough air. A baby bird takes its very first breath before it hatches. Did you know that? Uh, you've noticed that when you peel a, a boiled egg, sometimes there's like a, on the uh, wide end of the egg, there's like a little sack there, there's some space between there. Well, the little bird uh, breathes that way. That little air sac lets air in to the egg and lets air out. You want, you want to, how do you breathe? Let's breathe, let's breathe. In, out. One more. That's it. how we breathe. Well, that little bird is, is breathing inside there. And before it hatches, it starts to peck away at that little sack inside there, and it pecks through the sack, and, and it's going beep, 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 and then pretty soon it gets enough pure, fresh air that it gets strong enough that it can peck out of the egg and get hatched. Yes, and all the time it's going beep, 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 and then comes out of the egg. And I like to think that the baby bird is praising God with its very first breath. <laughs> so you have breath, don't you? Yes. Everything that lives has breath. And I think that's really awesome. And the Bible says that everything that has breath do what? Praise the Lord. That's right. And so would you like to sing with me right now? Would you like to praise the Lord? Let's sing praise him, praise him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. Okay, sing with me because I'm not a very good singer, so I really need your good voices to sing that song. Okay, ready? Praise him, praise him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. Praise him, praise him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. Now, do you think that the grown people out here uh, uh, who are breathing should praise the Lord. Okay, let's ask them to sing it. We'll help them because they'll probably need help. They're older, you know, more breath. And so they're going to sing, and we're going to help them sing that. Praise him, praise him, all you grown-up children, okay? All right, folks, out here. Praise him, praise him, all you grown-up children. God is love, God is love. Praise him, praise him. God is love, God is love. So you all have a super Sabbath. And you can back in the Thank you. So, probably none of you are like me, hopefully, in this respect, uh, but I was thinking about um, familiarity breeds, does anyone know the rest of that? Contempt. Okay, so I changed it just a little bit. Familiarity breeds complacency. So I was thinking about in our relationship, so if you're married in that relationship or parent-child relationship, it's so easy. If, if, let's say you're home, you're doing something, and man, your wife comes to the door, She's been gone shopping at Aldi or wherever she went. So what do you do? So one option is to just keep doing what you're doing. Hey, hon, welcome home. You might not even say anything. Um, if you're like our dog who greets us in the morning, this is like the best thing that ever happened to you. I mean, to see her walk through the door, not our dog, but to see your wife walk through the door, <laughs> it's like this, just an awesome experience. And, and I was thinking about that with giving. So how many offering appeals do you remember? 
Probably not too many. Um, when someone stands up to give one, you probably think, oh, here comes another one. Um, I was reading uh, a book, uh, and many of you may have heard this quote, but talking about our relationship with Christ. It says, but a profession without this deep love is mere talk, dry formality, and a heavy drudgery. So we want to be familiar with Christ, but really the basis of our relationship is a deep love. And giving is just a response of that deep love we have. So hopefully your giving today is not heavy drudgery or, dr or mere talk, but it's a, actually a, an exciting time of awe and giving back to God. Our uh, offering today is for church budget. Um, some of you may know what that goes for. If you don't, Fred would be happy to talk to you about that. Um, but church budget, we're only behind a little bit. I saw $7,372. So that's what we need today. So if you can just give $7,372 today, we're good. So please give joyfully uh, with familiarity, but especially with the awe. Let's let the deacons please stand up. Father, uh, we want to continue in our relationship with you, uh, not with dryness and drudgery, uh, but with a sense of awe, a sense of expectation. Father, I pray that for each of us, we can experience the deep love of friendship with you. Uh, every moment, every day is a new day with you. And I pray that our offering today will be given uh, with hearts full of love, with hearts full of awe for you. We sure love you. Please take the money that's given today uh, to advance um, whatever ministries you have in mind for it today. We have it earmarked for church budget, and I pray that you will use the money for whatever purposes you have for our church. We love you. Thanks for being our God. Amen.
Our scripture today is from Acts 11, 23 through 26. When he arrived and saw the evidence of, great, of the grace of God, he was glad and was encouraged and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples who were called Christian, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. I would just uh, like to take a moment for you guys to just look at your bulletin. Um, inside our bulletin, we have lots of people that are struggling and suffering right now, going through a lot of different trials. And I just encourage you to, to cut that out and put it on your um, refrigerator and pray for them over the week. Um, and uh, pray for our church family as well. On the back of our bulletin, we have um, just a, 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 a way of our church to pray for our members and to be connected with each other and reach out to each other So, and for God to lead in their lives as well. Would you please um, take a moment to uh, kneel as far as possible as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day, for the opportunity to come to you today and just worship you and look to you in all that we do. We pray, God, today that you will just draw so near to us that your Holy Spirit is in this place. We pray, God, that you will lead Pastor Rashawn as he speaks today, that you will put your words in his mouth and that your spirit moves him in the way that you would have him um, talk with us today, God. I pray that each and every heart today is open to you and um, that you're working in each one of our lives. Please be with the ones in our church that are suffering and struggling and that are um, needing someone to reach out to them. I pray, God, that you will give us hearts to see those people and to reach those people for you, God, um, and to be your hands and feet to each other. God, we love you. We thank you so much for all you've done in our lives and continue to do in our lives. Please grow us and lead us to you. In Jesus' name I pray and thank you. Amen. That was me? Oh, okay. I'll just use the mic. All right, um, let's try this again. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. How are we doing this morning? Good. Amen, amen. I am happy to be here this morning. Um, interesting topic, but we're going to pray that God leads us this morning, amen. amen? When you hear the word Christian, what comes to your mind? 
Christians have been around for a long time now, and Christians have shaped the very world that we live in in a very interesting and beautiful way. Scientists like Sir Isaac Newton, who made profound discoveries in math, Galileo, who contributed to the knowledge we have about the solar system, Louis Pasteur, where we get pasteurization from. George Washington Carver, the guy who invented peanut butter, and many of other amazing things said that his faith in Jesus was the only mechanism in which he could effectively pursue and perform the art of science. Civil rights activists like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was also a Christian. Dr. King sought to change a racially divided society to a place where people of all races can get along. Amen? We experience that today. Presidents like John Quincy Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Grover Cleveland, and my favorite, Abraham Lincoln. I love this painting that Nathan Green, you know, the Adventist painter who did the Blessed Hope, painted of Abraham Lincoln. It shows Lincoln during the Civil War reading the scriptures because he was a man of the word, amen? In Lincoln's house divided speech, he uses Jesus' words, a house divided against itself cannot stand. To emphasize the necessity of unity in America, he said in the speech, I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. They were activists willing to be active in order to activate change. Let me say that one more time. They were activists willing to be active in order to activate change in the world that we live in today. Somebody say amen. amen. These men of faith understood that in order to motivate change, it would be vital and effective to include Jesus. Now, where there's a bright side, it seems like there's always a dark side, right? History has proven that there have been people who have came in the name of Christianity, who have used Christianity as a reason to kill, steal, and destroy. This type of mentality has served as a huge stumbling block for Christianity today. The apostolic church was flourishing until Antichrist came in claiming that they were living for Christ. But while they have done the church so much harm, God is calling us to reveal who he truly is. Amen? This morning, I want to talk about Jesus. Can we do that? I want to talk about Jesus and how we can be better followers of him. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully through this message title or take down the sign, we can leave here better understanding the gospel that we are called to give to the world. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all that you have done for us. Lord, we come here today because it has been given to us in your word, an exhortation by Paul. Let us not forget the assembling of ourselves as we see the day approaching. Lord, we have come together to praise your name for what you have done for us. Lord, we need a word from you this morning. We ask you to please Come down and dwell with us. Help us to know you better. Be with me now, Lord. Remove who I am and let you be exalted. Because you said all men will be drawn to you. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Turn with me to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Man, Acts is like a huge rebuke to me. A huge rebuke. Oh, I got to stay in there, Mike. 
But it's also been a blessing because it has been a, a, an effective guide for me in trying to understand how to be an effective witness for Christ. Amen? Who wants to be an effective witness for Christ? Acts is a great study book for us. Well, in Acts chapter 11, we see Peter is confronted by the brethren. He's confronted by the brethren. And they're asking him, Peter, what's going on? Why are you dealing with the Gentiles? And so like many of us, how we should respond to some confusion on how we are doing the work of God, he gives them a testimony. And so he tells them about his dealings with Cornelius and his household. He says that, you know, I was chilling on top of the house. And God gave me a vision. And in that vision, something strange. He asked me to eat some unclean meats. And I said, Lord, no. You know I have never put anything unclean in my mouth. And he continues to say that, that some men who, who were from Cornelius' household came and got him, and he went to Cornelius, and he preached the word to them. And at the word, they had received the Holy Spirit. And as the disciples of Christ are listening to this, they say, the Bible says that they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then... Has God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life? We see here a job that God is calling us to do, and that's to reach the world around us. Luke uses Peter's experience to emphasize what he's about to say next. Luke uses Peter's experience to emphasize what he's about to say next. Let's go to our text, Luke chapter 23. I mean, Luke chapter 11, verse 23. The Bible says, who when he came, had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people were added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek Saul, or in other words, Paul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year, for a whole year, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christian first in Antioch. So we want to break down this text. Now, you remember in, um, in, in, in chapter 7 when Stephen was killed, right? And then in chapter 8, Persecution came upon the church, and the Bible says the, skirt, the church scattered, and they began to preach the word, the word unto other places. So what Luke does is he wants to pick it right back up. He wants to pick the story right back up, and what he says has much to do with what happened when Stephen was stoned. But it's no longer in Samaria. Remember, it was in Samaria that the word was being preached and it was being received the way it was. And Peter and John went to go give the Holy Spirit. But this time it's in Antioch. It is in Antioch where people are receiving the word of God. It's having an amazing effect on the life. And people want to know more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus. Why? Why was it important? What caused these people in Antioch to call these men Christians? Only have one explanation, and that is they wanted to glorify God. They were glorifying God. We find out that the glorification of God becomes vital and essential to the Christian walk. It becomes important for us as Christians, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, to glorify who God is. 
So laying at the foundation of all of their energy in the book of Acts, laying at the foundation of all their energy in the book of Acts is the desire to be and testify of Jesus, be a witness and testify of Jesus. When Barnabas gets to Antioch, I can imagine he's full of smiles because of what the gospel has done in these people's lives. Somebody say amen. They're testifying of Jesus for a whole year, the Bible says. All they do is study and study and learn more and more about Jesus. Antioch. Antioch. It was a wealthy city. People from all over the world came to this city. It was a center of commerce. It was a resort. It was like Hawaii or something. It's interesting because it was a place of distraction. I mean, do we go to Miami to go tell people about Jesus? Do we go to Hawaii to go tell people about Jesus? Now, I'm not saying that there's not missionaries out there who's doing the work. But what I'm saying is that for the most part, we don't go to Hawaii to do the work. We go to vacation. And that's what Antioch was. It was a place where you wouldn't think that the word of God would actually have a fighting chance because people are so distracted. But the Bible informs us that it did. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm struggling because for me to give Bible studies in Kansas is a hard thing. But this brother's in Antioch. These brothers are in Antioch, giving the word of the Lord to them, and they're receiving it with gladness. It was here. It was in Antioch where the followers of Christ were first called Christians. Can somebody say amen? Powerful, powerful witness. It was to this place that, the, that Barnabas was sent. It was this place that Barnabas brought back Paul. And it will be the events of this place that will be presented as a strong proof in the Jerusalem council that God has given the message, has given the gospel to the Gentiles. When they have the Jerusalem council, Antioch is brought up. The dealings that have happened with the Gentiles is brought up. And people are led to Christ. But why? Why are they doing this? Why are we not as effective in places of resorts? Well, I believe that the, the message had an amazing effect, an effect on their lives. Telling the good news had aspirations and had connections with the hope of Jesus coming soon. Amen. The good news was about Jesus, and they couldn't help but to tell people about Jesus because they knew that they were going to see him again. Hope in the day when, behold, he will come in the clouds and every eye will see him. The hope that is explained in Acts chapter 1 when the disciples are standing there gazing, watching Jesus go into heaven and two angels are standing there asking them, why are you standing here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken away from you into heaven, will come back in like manner. These are the same disciples who got together and did exactly what Jesus said. He said, stay in Jerusalem. Stay and wait because I'm going to give you the spirits. Now, what would have happened if they decided not to do what Jesus said? They wouldn't have received the Holy Spirit. Plain and simple. They understood that the instructions of Jesus were essential to them being witnesses. We are also instructed to do the work. Laying at the very foundation of the work we are called to do is the hope that Jesus will come again. Seven-day Adventists. It's in our name. Well, let me expound. The work that we are called to do, 
Jesus says he wants to do. If you come to prayer meeting, and this is just a, a, a quick commercial break. If you come to Jesus, we're teaching and we're talking about how to allow Jesus to work in your life. Amen? Amen. Now I'm back to our regular schedule programming. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who has sent me while it is day because the night cometh when no man can work. Jesus is saying, I'm wanting to do a work. Amen. I am wanting to do a work. Paul then says, Paul says that he that has begun a good work in me will finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. The Bible is telling us that the work that Christ is doing and will do he wants to do it through you. Somebody, man, come on. Christ wants to do a work within us. The question is, are we allowing him to do it on a daily basis? And why is it important for him to do a work in us? Because he's coming again. This needs to be our main focus because it was the apostles' main focus. It is what caused them to do the work. It's what gave them so much energy. It is why people in Antioch call them Christians. It was this promise that motivated the disciples to be a witness in all the world. Because they knew that when this gospel will be preached in all the world as a witness, the end will come. Come on, brothers and sisters. God is not willing that any should perish, but he wants all to come to repentance. That means he wants everybody to have a chance to get to know Jesus. But are you doing the work? Are you allowing God to do the work in you? It's the promise that motivated John the Baptist to preach the way he was preaching because he knew that Jesus was coming soon. He was preparing people for a message. And he knew that if they did not accept the message of the true witness, the reality that they would reject Jesus was real. Let me say that one more time. If they were not involved in the preparation of looking for Jesus, the reality was that when Jesus would come, they would reject him. When John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, they can now take their attention and place it upon Jesus because they have prepared their heart to accept him. That message, brothers and sisters, is a message of heart consecration and repentance that produces a life that mirrors the life of Christ. Let me say that one more time. God is asking us to preach and live a message that is of heart consecration, deep repentance, with, which produces a life that mirrors the life of Jesus. And I don't want to hear that it's impossible because the Bible says with you, things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The Bible says that he is the one who does the work. And if Jesus is the one at the head of the work, then brothers and sisters, whatever seems impossible to you should no longer be impossible. It should be possible because Jesus, with God, all things are possible. I thank God that Jesus, that it is Jesus that has promised that he will do both his will and to do of his good pleasure in us. I am thankful, Chapel Oaks, that the Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, not yet I, but it is Christ that's living in me. Come on, can we talk about Jesus this morning? It is Christ who is living in me. I am happy to say that it's Jesus who's the righteous one. Jesus wants to live in me. It is Jesus who prayed to the Father that they will be one as thy Father are in me and I indeed that they will be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. What is Jesus talking about? Well, a few chapters earlier, he explained to Philip, come on now, explained to Philip when Philip asked the question, show us the Father. Jesus says, come on, man. 
I've been with you for such a long time, and you don't know me? Isn't that interesting that Jesus takes the idea of knowing him and compares it to knowing the Father or seeing the Father? But the Father's not there. The Father's not there. What is Jesus talking about? Because it's a legitimate question that Philip has. Show us the Father. It's made plain to us, and I think it was plain to Philip. When Philip, show, when, when, when Philip says, show us the Father, Jesus says, well, you don't know me. Because if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus says this because he wanted him to know that being one with the Father, check this out, get this, please get this, being one with the Father has everything to do with character. Okay, did y'all get that? Being one with the Father has everything to do with character. Being one. That is what God wants. That is why Jesus tells his disciples when John the Baptist, who was held in prison, waiting death, who has doubt about Jesus' ministry, what does he tell him? He says, go and tell John what you see. The heal, the, the, the lame, they walk again. Those who, who are oppressed, they are healed. They're free. He tells them and he points them to the work that Jesus is doing. Somebody say amen. Jesus is at the head of the work. And so what Jesus has to do is point John, Baptist, John the Baptist and the disciples to the work that he's doing. It becomes the foundation. It becomes the foundation of their motivation to go and spread the gospel. Do you know that Jesus is working in your life? Come on now. Being one with God. That's what God is asking us to do. So when Jesus prays in John 17 that his followers be one, it's not only the reality of the church becoming unified, but the church living just like Jesus. We must live just like Jesus. It's vital because at the end of the verse, it says, so that they know that you have sent me. Amen. Doesn't that sound familiar? So that they know that you have sent me. The disciples have grabbed hold of this concept in Acts. This is the reason why they're called Christians. They've grabbed hold of this concept and their willingness to allow the Holy Spirit to work in their life. Because they understand that Jesus says, when the spirit of truth shall come, he will guide you in all truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Those are Jesus' words. He and they understand that it is important for them to have the spirit because it is the spirit that will renew their hearts. They understand that, is, that the Spirit does not speak of himself. They understand that it is the Spirit that teaches us what sin is, what righteousness looks like, and what the great controversy is all about. It is the Spirit that is doing the work in us. The Spirit is vital in order to prepare and to be to prepare others for the coming of Christ. Let me say that one more time. The Spirit is vital in order for us to be prepared and to prepare others for the coming of Christ. It is vital. It is important. There's no other way. Because the Spirit testifies of Jesus. And if we want to live like Jesus, we need the Spirit. Amen? Oh, man. Come on now. We are to work. Our work is based upon our hope and the coming of Christ. We are called to be a light shining in a dark place. We are called to be salt in the earth. We are living in a world that is surrounded by so much gross darkness. 
demonic movies are being produced, and if it's not demonic, it has some type of sexual insinuations inside of them. Teaching our kids they can act however and do whatever they want to do in the name of goodness. We live in a dark world. Church, the Lord has been convicting me about the things that I put in my mind and the things that I watch, even if they're borderline. Because borderline is not included as one of the fruits of the Spirit. We are called to be salt in a world that is flavorless. We are called to be salt in a world that is thirsty, hungering for righteousness. People want substance. They want substance. And it's the substance that we are living by that causes people to say, that is a Christian. I'm closing now. Soon, soon, brothers and sisters, Jesus will come to receive a people that are looking, that are looking forward to his appearing. Imagine, just imagine this with me this morning. If the president of the United States said to you that he will be coming to visit you sometime in the fall. He doesn't give you a day, but he, but he, but he gives you the characteristics of what will, ha- what will be happening around you. Just tells you, I'm coming in fall. The leaves will begin to fall. The air will get a little bit cooler. You got allergies like me. Your body will react a certain way. You will dread it. But there will be signs. The environment will change. People will act differently. They will wear clothing that they need. For you, there will be a work for you to do inside of your own home. It will be a work in anticipation of the president visiting your home. You will buy, see if y'all get this, you will buy and you will sell before the time comes. Because you don't want to wait too long when you can't do it anymore. Because he'll be coming. You will cancel all unnecessary meetings. Not that they're not important, but they're just unnecessary. That may put you in a position of unreadiness. Whatever it is, you don't want to be unready. It's preparation time. And you want to be ready. Most of us will prepare. Some because you don't like Obama, would it? <laughs> Y'all didn't get that. But whoever you want to place in a position of influence, go ahead. The way we prepare for any earthly king, we need to prepare for the king of the universe. In preparing, brothers and sisters, is living just like him. With the power of the Holy Spirit and latter rain power, we can live just like Jesus. Revelation 18 verse 1 promises us, brothers and sisters, that an angel will come down from heaven with great power and the earth will be lightened with his glory. The earth will be lightened with the character of Jesus. Now how I think, not how I think I should live, but it says with his glory. Not my righteousness, but with his righteousness. 
His glory. That's an end time message. It's not my righteousness. Revelation 18, 1 is talking about. It's talking about Jesus, his glory. The world benefits off our message. The world may not recognize it, but they love Christianity. It is the work of the gospel that heals those who are broken. It is the work of the gospel that stops the bleeding. The story is told of a young man and his, and his wife who have just been married. And they're on their way to their honeymoon. It's the winter time. And as they're traveling on the road, the road conditions are not that great. They are not that great. And they come to a sharp turn. And as the, the, the husband makes the turn, he loses control and he falls into a ditch. Both of them knock unconscious. But the husband comes to first, and, and he looks around in confusion, and he looks over to his wife, and he sees that she's still unconscious, and she's bleeding from the head, and she needs to seek medical attention right now. So he hurries up, takes off his seatbelt, gets out of the vehicle, goes and runs to the other side, and opens the door, and, and he pulls his wife out. And as he pulls her out, he sees right across the street a doctor's office. What better situation? So he runs with his wife across the street, and he, and he goes up to the door, and he knocks on the door. And an older gentleman comes to the door, and, and he says, Doc, Doc, we just got into an accident, and my, my wife, she needs you. She's bleeding from the head. And, the doctor looks at his wife and he looks at the man and he says, I'm sorry, I don't practice anymore. The man looks confused and distraught by the statement and he, and he, says, to the, he says to the doctor, doctor, as I see it, you have only two options. You either help my wife, stop her from bleeding, or you take down the sign. Or take down the sign. We are living in a world, brothers and sisters, that is bleeding. People are bleeding. Our communities right next to this church is bleeding. And they need Jesus, the only healer. But brothers and sisters, if we don't start doing something about the bleeding, we need to go and take down our sign. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we need you in our lives, Lord. We need you in order to be a witness to our world. You have called us to go, to go. But Lord, in order for people to believe that it is you that have called us to go, we need to be just like you. We need to be one with you and the Father and the Spirit, Lord. Lord, thank you so much for all that you have done and will continue to do. Be with us now, Lord, as we leave this place. Let us fellowship with one another, encouraging one another as we see the day approaching. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Amen. Y'all is coming to do the benediction. Let's bow our heads for the benediction. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. You're excused. <laughs>